just something I put up um, to play. Uh, it's only two minutes, but I've been playing along there uh, over lunch. Some, uh, a project uh, we're working on in Scotland. Uh, we're designers on a DBOM scheme. Uh, it's a large motorway scheme uh, in, uh, between uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, we're working with our project partners, Froville, uh, Ligon, uh, Amy. And, and again, just something we extracted out of uh, from one of our project meetings last week. Something we've used uh, for the benefit of it, uh, whether it was the design team, the contractor, um, constructor, contractor, um, and are the you know the local uh, the local people the, the the stakeholders involved? Complicated junction. It's over uh, 600 uh, meters in length. Uh, currently at grade, going to free flow junction. Uh, but just I suppose the power of some of the information we can pull um, from a BIM environment um, uh, that previously uh, might not have been available uh, to us. So I suppose what I'm going to do here, together with Ruth, and I think. We'll be fighting over the minutes, Ruth, but I think I'll try and do. I'll try and stick to eight minutes, and you've twelve, or we'll see how, how we go. So very quickly, I suppose it, it, it's our journey in terms of um, where we have come over the last number of years, uh, um, trying to deliver what we've always done, but now in a BIM environment. So we're not here to preach to anybody, but we're just telling you our story and what has worked for us. And it's always comforting when the finance uh, section of any group tell you that uh, you're making a difference. Numbers have gone up, percentages have gone up, uh, new wins have gone up. So I'm going to start taking a, a borrowing a line there out of 1192. For the production of information to be truly lean, we must begin with the end in mind. And with that in mind, I suppose, I, you're going to hear us talk a little bit about uh, a higher diploma in engineering in BIM, something that we sought out. Uh, got involved in and developed um, from 2009 on with the local university in Ireland, uh, Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, something that we have, um, over 60 of our employees have gone through to date. And of course, here and we're here in BRE, the level two business systems uh, certification. I put those up there at the beginning because they have been instrumental in our journey to date, uh, in particular in delivering the projects. Um, I'm not really here to sell RPS, but it, the, the context is important because it feeds into the challenges that we had to deal with uh, as a group. So we're a large group, yes, we have 580, 5,000 in the group, 580 Ireland, 2,500 between here in the UK. But, you know, and we've been, you know, implementing or trying to implement BIM on a number of our projects over the last few years, um, significantly, I would say, into the UK, large infrastructure projects. and and also some um, uh, typical uh, structure type projects, more so at home, uh, pharmaceutical and, other, and otherwise. Like, like lots of people here, we introduced early BIM back in 2007 and we've been slowly trying to move on from there since. That's a, a wheel that has been associated with us in terms of our marketing material for many years uh, and maybe in the last 12 months We've, we've, we've put BIM in there at the heart of it. And the reason we've done that is, just like project management, health and safety, uh, we don't want BIM to be something that's tagged on. Uh, it's, it's basically delivering what we've always done, uh, but, but through this new environment. What we do, everything from planning, environment, transport, water, uh, commercial, all the way right through to buildings and structures. Uh, we deliver those projects, and we've always had to deliver them in an efficient, coherent manner, but even more so now with the level two uh, BIM requirements. So for us, it, it, was, um, it was something that would be at the, the core of what we've, uh, we've always done. I'm not going to go into the 1192 and the, and the, the past series, but these are systems that we have uh, started to embed um, across our projects. And we've been able to do that right through from design construction and now into some of the operation phases uh, on the basis of our DB or DBOM um, consortiums that we have um, on a number of our, on, uh, our projects. A good old recession, I suppose, helped us focus our mind in terms of where we were going. And back in late 2008, early 2009, we suffered a, uh, we came from the Celtic Tiger Times down to the recession back in Ireland. And there's been lots of talk here over the last <coughs> days, two days about SMEs and all of that type of thing, about maybe lack of leadership. 
I, I, pretend, I prefer to focus on things like ownership, taking ownership, responsibility, uh, partnership, innovation, and, and you know, continuing on with project delivery. And like, like lots of companies, you know, we were operating, our place are no different, we were operating in this competitive uh, marketplace uh, and industry is changing. And like people said, we could innovate or liquidate. Well, w w it was like that for us too. And we were coming from a position where we, were, we had experience in delivering large infrastructural projects over 20 years in Ireland. And all of a sudden, there was no money to do this back home. And we had to look and see uh, at other markets outside of Ireland and obviously looking at our nearest neighbour, UK and beyond. Lots of people said BIM was too, um, too big a change. When we started looking at it, there was no flexible programme suitable to our particular needs. Um, and also we had to be conscious of the limited uh, investment um, due to the recession um, in terms of CPD. That document there, I suppose, was one of the first documents we became aware of when we started looking at work over here. Um, and while we had offices here, to be clear, we had a number of offices operating in the UK market, uh, they didn't have or weren't coming from the large infrastructural type projects. It was more planning, architecture, surveying type of work. So we were kind of bringing uh, a new thing here. Collaborative working through BIM requirement. Um, we saw the, the deadline passed this week, 3D BIM by 216. And obviously, uh, other European countries and uh, US further afield all looking at that. For us, the key thing here was opportunity. So how are we going to keep people that had good jobs back home um, and give them new opportunities? In terms of training, we undertook a partnership approach uh, with a very forward-thinking local university. And we developed, um, and, and just in terms of, Mervyn mentioned it, that level eight is in terms of a national framework of qualification. So effectively what that means, we have level five is what we call leaving cert, level six is your cert, is your cert level seven is your ordinary degree, level eight is, a, is an honours degree. So we developed an honours level, uh, an honours degree programme with the local university and we, we've trained a number of people up in that. Long before the mandate came into place over here, we've all been seeing this. Quite funny, we've seen the use of full level two collaborative BIM process is a requirement. We've seen that without seeing any EIR or any of that documentation or that type of documentation uh, coming with that request. Uh, but at the same time, we could give out about it or we could try and see what we could do to get into this space. And that's what we've done. So in terms of, I suppose, our story and what we've done, we took a number of documents that, that we saw produced over here. And a couple of things happened at the time. We, there was a change in, in, in leadership in our own group back home. We had a new MD. And he published a new strategy for our group, four-year plan, in terms of what we needed to do if we were going to keep the doors open and keep moving forward. So I suppose uh, we published a strategy statement on the basis of where we were going to go, our plan, supported by things like we talked about or you heard about earlier, human resources strategy. How do we get these new people in? How do we train up the people we have? And we so supported that there by what we call a BIM and technical services strategy, something that was handed to me, Bobby, back in 2009, 2010. And again, that was enabling people work across those sectors that I talked about, uh, deliver projects efficiently and effectively. One of the things that the recession taught us about, and you're part of a bigger group, is this thing, utilization. So we could be busy in one of our sectors, or sections of our thing. So transport could be up, commercial could be down. So what do you do? Do you get rid of all these people? So we, we trained people in a multidisciplinary way. Yes, of course, you could be an expert or have special skills in terms of structures or transport, but that doesn't, that doesn't stop you from working in another sector and using some of those skills. Staff themselves identified gaps in terms of our own this appraisals process. We set up a very uh, naive BIM working group in 2012 and said they'd have run away from it if they knew what they were getting into, and on we went. This is our wheel that we talked about. This is the program uh, we developed, and, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but basically what we did here was from uh, virtual modeling, infrastructure, collaboration, and then those people that wanted to move into the honors degree 
and be able to become chartered, which is another requirement that was running alongside this. This enabled that. We were awarded uh, a number of uh, prizes or press papers on the basis of this collaborative uh, approach over the last uh, two years. Uh, that's just another slide there, something that's going on either here or back home in terms of, we talked about this industry uh, academia collaboration requirement and something that can be done and we were very fortunate in terms of uh, the, the local university effectively opening up their doors to us. Uh, we provided them with projects so they were able to, to use some of our information to develop the type of programs they needed and again we, we sharing that information through what we call these uh, BEM regions. I think I've done that in about the eight minutes Ruth and maybe you can carry on from there. So um, as Mark has said, um, over the second half of, of this presentation I'm going to provide an overview of projects where we have integrated BIM. Um, as a multidisciplinary company um, we, we can provide examples of a number of design elements or discipline, disciplines where we have integrated BIM. Um, as a, a geotype person working in the geotechnical section of our, our organisation, I'm going to provide some examples of how we've applied BIM principles in GIS and in geotechnical data management. Um, some examples of how, we, how we've been rapidly been, been able to ex efficiently, I should say, extract selected information as required by the client at various project stages from the BIM model. Um, and, and throughout all of this, there's been a, a common thread in that it's what we've always been doing. Um, there's nothing essentially new in terms of, of, of how we think as such, but it's, it's more now we have new tools and software which can talk to each other. They're interoperable. Um, we have a defined process and it's all within a single environment. So the whole, the whole process has become <coughs> much more efficient. Um, GIS, it's, it's um, a, a very, very useful tool. It's, it's, it's not new. It's widely used for high level constraints analysis, route selection studies, etc. Um, we've used it a lot more kind of on, on the planning side um, at a high level to carry out your constraints analysis, spatial analysis, etc. Um, we have used um, GIS data within BIM to, um, to communicate um, constraints and major issues to stakeholders and the client. Um, for, for this example, it's just a, a section of road that is running through an area uh, prone to flooding. So um, we were able to quite quickly just to provide an overview, um, have a, a, a rivet model of, 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 the, of a bridge and, and, the, and uh, a model of the road. and simulate um, various flood levels um, over the topography just to provide an indication to the client of, of this constraint. So obviously um, they face major constraints in this area. Um, drilling down then a, a little bit um, more focused when it comes to detailed design and um, the management of geotechnical data during uh, detailed design and actually um, um, delivering the, the geotechnical design. Um, this is what we have we had been doing over the past number number of years ourselves and other design organisations like ourselves. Um, essentially, what we have here is a, uh, a plan and profile section up on the top, the uh, the road alignment, and um, the locations of boreholes, trial pits, geophysical survey pro profile lines. The bottom section then is a, a geotechnical section. Um, all the borehole sticks are, are indicated, the different soil layers, and um, interpreted water levels from, from the boreholes and um, also an interpreted um, ground profile from the geophysical surveying that was carried out in this instance. And, and, and this is, you know, it's fantastic. It is, it is really, really good. Um, it's essential information for the design of a project. Um, and even th um, listening to all the talks yesterday about um, what's required to build a BIM model, um, everything was from the ground up. There was no mention at all of, of the subsurface um, we can't assume the subsurface is homogeneous because it's far from homogeneous. Um, we, we build on the ground. Um, all our structures are within the ground material. The ground material surrounds it. So it's vital that we understand this from the very beginning to inform the most efficient design, to be aware of all risks and to provide a, um, a cost-effective construction solution to the client. Um, so. As I said, this is, this is, is very useful, but 
there are there are many um, tools available to us now to better manage or, um, geotechnical information. And this is just a very, very quick, this would have taken a matter of minutes um, to, to generate. It's for using whole base SI, which is a, it's a Kinetics product and it has, um, it has a, an add-on, it's an add-on to Civil 3D. So the top sections there are boreholes in 3D and the bottom section is a, a very quick and crude, I know at the moment, um, section, similar to the one on the previous slide. But the whole point I just wanted to make is that this was generated, needs work, need, would need further work, but it was generated in a, in a matter of minutes as opposed to a number of days coordinating with the geophysical contractor, the site investigation contractor, playing with scales, all, all that type of thing. Um, this is just a, a BIM still extracted from um, our, a, one, our, our BIM model for the A9 dueling, um, another um, DB project a consortium we're working on here in the UK with um, Wills Brothers and John Paul Construction. Um, uh, d down on the bottom left hand corner there we have um, the borehole data in, in Civil 3D. So um, you can see the alignment and, um, and the underpass and the, the data in 3D space there. So immediately all the information is in the one, one, one space. And even just to, if I go, oh no, I meant to go back. Um, in this previous slide where we have a, a bridge structure there, you see there's a lot of clustered boreholes on top of each other when presented in 2D, but you can spatially um, see it much better when, when we have it in 3D. Now, of course, the designer will um, look at the borehole logs, extract the relevant geotechnical test data to derive parameters for, for design, and there's that whole process, but it's saving an awful lot of time having it all in the one space so the design can be properly coordinated. Um, just wanted to show this as well to show other techniques that are available, non-intrusive geophysical techniques to build our ground model. Just trying to highlight lots of different ways of, of getting this information. It's vital that it all goes into the BIM model at the start of the project. Um, these images were provided to us by Scantech, a GPR um, consultant, in, consultant in Ireland. Um, GPR is, a, is, is just one of many geophysical techniques that has a wide range of applications. Um, possibly the most widely known is utilities detection. So the contractor can provide you with, if there's no other means of, of getting a first pass ID of ground conditions or location of utilities, they can provide the interpreted location in, in, a, in poly, polyline that can be brought into, um, into Civil 3D and used to refine the ground model. It's not design, but it's, it's just information that can be used to build the ground model to produce an, a, an efficient design. Um, so again, I suppose I better move, move away from the geo side to something more, more, more general civil side. Um, this is just a, um, the geometric design of uh, the Wraith underpass, which was um, part of the M8 improvements um, um, from the animation that was shown um, just before our presentation. Um, again, very complex interchange going from at grade to free flow. And um, this was done in Civil 3D. It was our first time using it, so it was a, a steep enough learning curve for us to make the transition from MX to Civil 3D. Um, again, just an example to show how information can be quite easily extracted. Um, nothing new here again, um, two 3D topographic surveys of a quarry actually, and we just needed to provide an estimate of the quantities of material extracted. Um, for, for, for planning purposes. So very quickly, you can just um, get your, 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 your volume of material that was extracted, um, the blue being the kind of newer survey. So, And again, applying the same principle um, to, to, to a road construction project. Um, again, different people want different things from the BIM model, but um, our experience with um, or the, the DB side of things is they, it's all about mass <coughs> um, in terms of cost and earthworks. Um, where is the what, where do we want to take where, where are we taking material from what what kind of material is it and where is it going to so that we can rapidly we can easily extract that from our, our single model environment and in, in a live sense as the as the designs evolving and inform the contractor um, 4d and 5d then time and cost um, you can't have one without the other um, I'm just going to run this um, simulation here if my mouse Oh, there it is. Um, it's just, oh, didn't mean to do that. It's um, just a, um, a simulation of a construction sequence, again extracted from the BIM, BIM model for the M8. Um, you can see our um, piles have just gone in there, carriageway and bridge decks. 
Um, just illustrating that with the, the programme, I think it's a 12 week programme over, over the bottom and then we have our time and materials cost um, up, up on the top left hand side there. Again, it's, it's only just a, a representative example of, um, of what we can do in this, in this space. Um, in terms of data collection and model verification, um, we, can, we can capture and post-process um, point cloud data into a BIM environment. So as, as set out in Pass 1192, this is, this is a, a requirement. So we've been, we've, been doing, we've been doing that as well and it's working very well. Um, these are just, just, we just have a couple of um, BIM of stills here, extracted again from, from the BIM model um, that you saw earlier. Um, so, so it's essentially it's just to we we it was a, a definitely a steep learning curve for, for us on this one of our first projects in a in a BIM environment. Um, there was a, a steep learning curve, but but the benefits are are being realised on on the collaboration and um, project improvements that have been brought about. And um, results then. Hopefully, I'm on time for the next lady who has a flight to make. So I'm conscious of that. Um, what has um, our, our BIM journey resulted in, in RPS? Um, as Mark outlined earlier, we have developed a, a flexible and industry orientated higher diploma in engineering in BIM, um, with, which is available to the wider indus industry um, in Ireland and the UK. <laughs> so um, we, as, as part of that, it enabled the collaboration between industry and academia. Again, as was discussed yesterday as being a challenge and that the, 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 our community needs to do more of it, um, but um, we, we've done that and it's been, and been very successful. We've simulated these new levels of engagement with, um, with academia that we, are, we, will, continue, we will continue doing. Um, and following on from that, we've, we've published a, a number of papers and um, one of them has been um, selected as best paper at the uh, CETA BIM gathering earlier on, or just towards the end of last year in Dublin. Um, the, this initiative actually has also been was also shortlisted by Engineers Ireland as um, CPD for CPD Employer of the Year in 2014. Um, we have we've upskilled our staff. We've lots of new staff with that are that are BIM, BIM enabled, and um, we've increased turnover and new business opportunities. We we had a couple of years ago we had about two percent of our business in the UK, and now we've over forty percent of business in the UK. Um, so, so it's all good, and um, we have all the standards and protocols are in, pla are in place, and we're working on implementing them throughout our other offices as well, throughout the organisation. So, so that's our results in a nutshell. Of course, um, it all cul culminated. All of these successes um, helped us achieve, and has culminated in our level two certification here with um, with the BRE, and um, we're we're still on a journey um, to to roll that out across all our other offices as well. And um, we, we're on the road to doing that with, with BRE. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's, me. that's, that's me, thank you. Thank you.